So uh, we had the equilibrium point, which was the non-trivial one. So there was a bunch of trivial ones, like 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, gets from point to the model. But the one of interest was this one. So when, right. So I should start doing this. Um, when I denote equilibrium points, I'll put a star on them. So you know they're different from regular points. So it was one third, one third. And we computed that the eigenvalues, or rather I computed the eigenvalues. Nine of you gave me different eigenvalues, which are all wrong. But it's okay. We got one eigenvalue, which is I over root 3. And the other one was the quantity, so minus I over root 3. And we stopped at this point, because any time so far, that we've been trying to analyze stability of equilibrium points, we've always relied on looking at the real part of the eigenvalue, so whether it's positive or negative. Here, the real part is zero. And if it was just one of them that was zero, it would be OK. But in this case, we have two zero eigenvalues. So remember, we have real. So we cannot use, so this is, I should actually write some of this down. So we cannot use the Hartman Gorman theorem because we have two, a 2D center line. So we have no way of using the eigenvalues to determine the stability problem. And I told you that this actually has, in the two-dimensional case when this happens, it has a special name. So it's not called a saddle source or sink. In this case, it's called a center. And why is it called this? It's called this because if this is your equilibrium point, let's say here, then you have a series of concentric circles. Or, in other words, stable orbits around the equilibrium. So, as these type of centers are what we call stable, but not asymptotically stable. And what is the difference between stable and asymptotically stable? Anybody? In the long term, one is stable where the other is not. Almost. In the case of stable, we just have orbits that are stable around the equilibrium point, but they never approach, they never become into the equilibrium point. They never tend to the equilibrium point. Asymptotically stable, eventually you have something like this. So you'll start off with orbits around it, but each concession one goes, spirals in, and eventually reaches the equilibrium. So that is the difference between stable and asymptotically stable. So this never approaches the equilibrium point, it will get very close to it, but never go to it. This will eventually reach the equilibrium. So that is the difference. In terms of the center, how stable is it? Extremely stable. Actually, there's a word for it. It's called uh, the Alpinostic. And this is what I wanted to try to prove to you, but it's actually quite difficult to do. Um, the proof, so I'll just sketch it, like I'll find it for you. Proof of stability in this case, when you cannot determine it by the eigenvalues, involves what I said before, which is finding these. Uh, the open up. So very quickly, how would you do this? First, if you remember what we did was, we said pick a domain. So pick some domain. Your choice. But importantly, that contains the equilibrium. Okay. 
Then the second step is to pick a function. Call it B of vector x. So it's a multivariate function. So in this case, it would be B of x1, x2. Then once you pick this function, you have to do a bunch of things. First, you must show that at the equilibrium point, so in terms of one third, one third, this function is zero. Your choice. Then once you show this, once you show that, then you have to show that b of x is greater than zero on b, or on, did I call this at b? I just called it, let me label the domain d just to this domain I will call. So you must show that the function is strictly positive on D. Then the fifth thing is you must show that dV by dt is less than or equal to zero on D. Now, here's the complication. If dV by dt you find is less than zero for all points on the domain, then we call this Asymptotic history. Then the equilibrium point, x star, I should say, is asymptotic history. If you are not able to show that it's strictly less than zero, and the best you can do is show that it's equal to zero, then you just say it's zero. And if you can show that your function and domain that you choose satisfies 1 through 5, we call that a strict Leontina function. Now, it's not possible to find a function for this case, the center case, because centers are not asymptotically stable. So you will not ever be able to find it. In theory, that means that they are stable. I should be able to find this, but it's impossibly hard. I try it all weekend. It's very hard. Okay. The question is because you see, Lyapunov's theorem, it does not tell you how to find these functions. As with most math theorems, they tell you the result, but they don't actually tell you how to get the result you want. So it's completely arbitrary. So there are always candidate functions you can try. And like I said, it's, it's not trivial. Because picking this domain that contains one third, one third, okay, fine, you pick some other neighborhood that contains this point. But then you have to test all these things, and every step of the way you would trip up. If you go back and change your domain slightly, it's, it's kind of hard, actually. But some candidate functions that typically one tries, is something like bx1, bx2 is equal to x1 squared, let's say plus x2 squared. It satisfies certainly over any domain, it's positive. It's zero, well, this is where I should be careful. I should have actually picked x1 minus 1 squared plus x2 minus 1 squared. So, it's positive, it's zero at my equilibrium point. But here's where the problem comes in. dv by dt is equal to 2 x1 minus 1 third times x1 times plus 2 x2 minus 1 third times x2 times. x1 times x2 times we wrote down from before. Those are just the differentials. It's very difficult to show that this is less than or, or equal to zero, actually. Over some domain that contains one third one third. So this function will not work. So you have to keep trying different different functions is what I'm trying to say. And eventually you'll give up. Another one I tried was something like log of one third x1 x2. 
which is also um, one over nine. See, I'm forgetting that. So this is zero at x1 equals to x2 is one third. It's positive for a certain domain. The derivative will be negative for a certain domain. And then it will not work at all. So you can keep trying different, different functions with this. Yes? The domain times x1 times one over nine. Yes, we get x1 equal to one third. Oh, you're right, it should be nine. Yes, nine. So, I mean, you try different, different functions, and they'll satisfy some of these properties, but they'll not satisfy others. If you keep increasing your domain, so it's hard to do like this. So, I gave up and did a numerical solution. But it is stable, centers are always stable. Maybe one day I'll be able to find one. You see, I'm quite good. I couldn't find a function that worked for this. I don't know why. Okay. So, so that's that actually finding there the minimum of the function? Yes, yes, the strict minimum. That's what yes. So if you're finding the minimum of well, it's an energy function, where is it? It can be any type of function. It, in physical context, the optimal functions are always energy functions. So I just kind of gave away the answer to your question. Asking okay, no, it's okay. Um, it, it's very arbitrary what the function can be. It can be anything. So, and the domain can be anything too. But, but must it look like one of those functions? Or no. Is it best as it looks like one of those? Uh, no, no. These are just typical ones you try that seem to work in 90% of cases. So, why does the first one work? Because it's a positive definite function. So, quadratic forms, it's a completely quadratic. They're always positive. So, that's a good thing because you can fix it so that it will satisfy the first two properties. Log functions work similarly because log of one is always zero, and you can always fix the domain. But it's it's very arbitrary. Like it, there's a biggest point of frustration. So if you cannot find one, maybe there are you that can try and find it. I don't know. Maybe I should just give it one exam question. For your final exam, I should be marks find the log of function. Maybe. But anyway, so you can kind of see it. I wrote this in. I forgot my HDMI cable, so what I have to do is record my screen and put it on YouTube. So, pretend I have my Mac here. So, I, I, I should start uh, animating. Yeah. If it will pop up, it should. So the red circle in the middle is our one third, one third, one. I did it in 3D, so you can see the full system. The red circle in the middle is one third, one third, one third. And you can start to see these stable orbits that form around it. I'm going to change the orientation. So you can see it, the orbits, the solutions to the system, they never get one third, one third, one third. But they continuously stably grow go around it. So I, I do think more. So no matter how hard you try, no matter what initial condition you have, it doesn't matter. It will never hit that one. It will go close to it, but it'll never hit. So it's a center. So they're stable, the orbits never crash into the equivalent point. But it's not as important. And so on. So I, I think I've plotted like a thousand different solutions for this. With random initial yeah. yeah, so you can see. They never go to one third, one third, but they continuously form. So, well, that was for the next one. Okay, so everybody saw it's stable, but it's not as important as stable. I think it's the same idea with, yeah, okay, I will not give away your bonus question anymore. It's kind of over here. So it's stable, but it's not as important as stable. So what does that mean? That means that. I'll put that animation on, on Google so you can play it on. 
Um, so this means that the point x1 star x2 star equals to one third one third. And because of our constraint, x3 then must also equal one third as well. If you remember, since x3 star then is equal to one minus x2 star minus x3 star, this means that x3 is also equal to one third. So we have a stable point that all the orbits approach in terms of these circular orbits. One third, one third, one third. Which means that even though it's not as incredibly stable, it's still a Nash equilibrium. And what this means is that one third of the population chooses rock, one third will choose paper, and one third and you know this, this is what eventually happens in all rock, paper, scissors games. Unless you play a stupid strategy. Um, it's, what the point of this is basically saying is that it doesn't make sense to predominantly pick a strategy, right? Because if your approach is going to be, I'm going to play rock 100% of the time, then your opponent will know that and will just pick paper. So you lose each time. But if you randomize your strategy such that one third of the time you pick rock, one third of the time you pick paper, and one third of the time you pick scissors. But that's what everybody else is going to do too. So that's why it just, nobody will approach this one third state. But you just will keep bouncing back and forth. And that's what happens in rock paper scissors. Apparently this has some biological re re uh, relevance too, but I couldn't be bothered with it. Um, something to do with mutations or something. Okay. I'm not interested in biology. Are there, are there any biology majors in this course before I... Okay, I have to make sure. I don't want to put them in the York. <laughs> and that's why my next example is also an example from biology. <laughs> right. I will end with the nice physics one, actually. The last example will be from cosmology. So you'll see. Let's solve this. Any questions about this? So, impress your friends with game theory. You can do a lot, actually. We did really two fundamental examples. We did the scissors development, rock, paper, scissors. There's other ones, too. Um, but, uh, Is there a way that we can find examples and their solutions online? Practice? For what? Practice. Is this not good enough practice? Well, it's never enough. It's never enough? That's sad. That's sad. No, I mean, these examples are actual kind of results. I mean, I can give you some fake dynamical systems that you can work out, but what's the fun in that? But I, I, will, I will post them. It's much longer, but with the same. Because in that case, you'll have a bunch of stochastic differential equations. You're just doing numbers. So it will energy reach this point. Because you'll have repeated oscillations. It's, that's what you mean, right? So in my face portrait, oh no, I have to go on 3D now. OK, I'll pretend this is 3D. Okay. So let's just say this is 1 third, 1 third, 1 third. So we had a bunch of these uh, periodic solutions, right? Mm -hmm. so let's just say that's 1 third. That's what it was reminding me. Right. So eventually you approach, but really if you break this down, there's no time. But if you plot out time explicitly, you just get a bunch of oscillations. That's what you mean. So it's just you'll get the same result. But if multicolor is always the last resort, because you have to do like millions of iterations. But it's the same. Okay, any questions about this? Besides the off topic, wanting more practice questions? Yeah. <laughs> Monte Carlo is fine. All the bankers use it. But they have no idea what they're doing. Here. No, I mean, uh, much of uh, constitutive finance is done in Monte Carlo. So we, end up, we may end up stuck like 2008. Oh, I can tell you stories about that. 2008, the financial collapse was a combination of. People not knowing what they're doing. Which are the MBAs. And then. Combination of assuming everything is normal, normally distributed, which is the only thing that business teachers understand. Huh. I have to control my comments. Yeah, yeah, it's just like, every keeps 
No, it's okay. Uh, it's fine. Okay, so uh, example two. This is going to be a much more involved example. Every example I will do now will be more involved in the business. So, this is what we call infectious disease modeling. Is it two L's? One. Two L's. Your L's. Always bigger. The room full of mathematicians. Good luck. But in North America, it's not like. Okay. So, what, why, why does dynamical systems come into play? It turns out that we spread of certain infectious diseases like measles or malaria or one of these things malaria um, can be modeled by a dynamical system or dynamical system and the simplest model oops, of this is called the SIR model. S I. Why is it called this? So I should make this point. Um, York's math department has like a thousand people working on infectious disease modeling, and I have opinions about why that is true, but I also must silence my voice on this as well. Um, no, actually, it's, uh, they do a lot of it, but it's like a lot of people think it's the same thing, so I don't understand. Like, you see, it's... It's like a different answer. I know, I don't understand what I just said. He said a few things. So why is it called SIR? It's because these are functions of time. And what do they mean? They mean, this is the population that are susceptible to the disease. Then you have a fragment of the population that's been infected. And R is the fragment of the population that has recovered. So you break up a population in terms of a susceptible category, an infected category, and a recovered Oh, that's nice. <laughs> All right. And then first, so with any model, we make a bunch of assumptions, which are practical in some cases, but often it's just a mathematical So one of these assumptions, so assumption number one, is that you assume that the population is constant. So nobody dies from uh, the, this disease being infected, and there's no new births or anything like that. So you assume that the population remains constant. Or maybe, okay, that's too constant. So in other words, S plus I plus R prime, so D, B, D, D by DT of this whole thing is zero. Now, in the SIR model, which is the simplest version of this disease modeling, we make one key assumption. In addition to this one. The key assumption in this model, so I will do the simple model first, then maybe on Wednesday I will relax this assumption. So the key assumption is what? It is that once an individual has recovered, uh, he, can, he or she cannot be reinfected. Which is actually not bad of an assumption. There are many diseases that work like this because you become immune to them. So examples are um, measles, mumps, smallpox, you know, other ones. So that's our key assumption. And of course, how do you write
write this down. So that's one assumption. Then we also have to make one more assumption. The other assumption is that the rate of transmission of the disease is proportional uh, to the number of encounters between susceptible and infected individuals. So that's the key, two key assumptions. So what does number two mean in letters? In Greek letters? It means the following. So in other words, what we say is that S prime, and prime I mean dv by, d by dt, right? You know this. S prime is equal to minus some number we call it beta. S and of course, beta I assume is just some positive parameter. Which is the rate of transition. So this I will you know this. And we assume it's some positive parameter. So this is the first time in this course we've done differential equations with the parameter. No, remember? So S and I are functions. Now I've thrown in some free parameter to complicate the life of the And we make one more assumption. The rate at which infected individuals are recovered is proportional to the number of infected, which is also a semi-reasonable thing to it. So at the end of the day, you get the following SIR equation. You get three equations. So the first one, I've already written down. S prime is equal to minus I, you get another equation which tells you the dynamics of the infected population, so I prime, which is equal to VSI minus this constant V times I, and you get a third equation, R prime is equal to VI, where in this case V and V or data are just positive. So V or nu, but I will just write V, because I cannot tell the difference between V and nu in my own idea. So V is just the rate at which infected individuals recover, and beta is the rate of transmission. But this is a dynamical system now, which has a bunch of not fixed numbers, like in the game theory cases, now has these arbitrary parameters. So it's going to complicate the life of the world. But notice something about this differential equations. And there's no R in the first two. So number three is actually a free equation. It's an extra equation. It's an auxiliary equation. The dynamics are really only covered in the first three. So this is what we call an auxiliary equation. Because there's no R in one. R is not in. One. And you can also see this in the following sense. I assume that the population was constant. So this means that R plus S plus I is equal. So we have another constraint, like we did with the game theory case. I can use this constraint also to eliminate one of the variables. But it's your choice. So our dynamics are completely covered by these two things. 
Any questions so far? So now what do you do? So there are nonlinear equations because of the SI problem. So it's hard to solve. So we must use our methods of analysis that you become quite good at. I hope. Okay. So, analysis. So what is the first thing I do when I'm encountered with a dynamical system? Yes. So step one, find the equilibrium. And that also will occur when the right hand side is equal to zero. So keep repeating this to yourself. This is. So in other words, we have two equations. Minus beta si is equal to, and the equilibrium points are going to be obviously s star i star. So find s star i star such that minus b s i is equal to zero, and where beta si minus b i is equal to zero. Any ideas? It's really easy to solve this. There's only zero zero. So when we find the equilibrium points, remember, we don't want to touch the parameters. We just want to know when S and I, which S and I solve this. So zero zero is one of them. But in general, what is the? Second. Second. Mm, no. What if I said i equals to zero? Just i. Does it work? So irrespective of what s is, i equals to zero seems to be equilibrium point for all values of s. So I actually have an infinite number of equilibrium points for this. I have a line of equilibrium points. So there's only one solution to this, namely that i is equal to zero. If i is equal to zero here, you get zero is equal to zero. If i is equal to zero, you get zero minus zero is equal to zero. So irrespective of what beta is, irrespective of what b is, irrespective of what r s is, i equals to zero. So what geometrically in my two-dimensional plane, what is special about i equals to zero? So what does it signify? The line is all the line. The SS. In other words, the entire Positive, because we're assuming that these are positive functions. The entire positive S axis, which is I equals to zero, contains equilibrium points of the system. Very cool. So every single point along the S axis is an equilibrium point. For I equals to zero. And this state signifies what? When I equals to zero? How many at this state infected people do you have? There's no infection. So there's no disease in this special equilibrium state. So the question is now, what is the stability property of this point? Or these points? And that's now, how do I do that? What is step two after I found the equilibrium points? So it's the same steps in every situation. Again and again. Okay. So remember, step two is Jacobian because we want eigenvalues. And how many eigenvalues am I expecting for this system? Because it's a two dimension. Okay. So the easiest thing when you're doing the Jacobian is to call this first function f1 and call this f2. Just like we did before. Because remember the general form is x prime is equal to fx. So x1 prime is equal to f1, 
x2 prime is equal to f1. In this case, x1 is s, x2 is s, and f1 is this, f2 is this. So then the Jacobian matrix is what? It's partial f1. So maybe if you well, I'll write it on this first way. Df1, x1, df1, partial x2, partial f2, partial x1, partial f2, partial x2. In our language, okay. So what is the first entry? What is partial f1, partial s? Negative beta i. Keep going. What's the second row, the first row, second column? The third one is going to be beta i and beta s. Right. Okay. So that's the Jacobian matrix for any equilibrium point. So now to find the eigenvalues, what do I do? I substitute in my point. So this is generated. So I found my Jacobian. Now step three is to sum in my equilibrium point. Which in this case is just i equals to zero. So what happens? We get the Jacobian. So if i is equal to zero, this is going to be zero. You get minus beta s zero and beta s minus b. So that is the derivative matrix at this point. Or at this point. So now I can find my eigenvalues. And now you see the complication. So my eigenvalues now will depend on beta and b. So hence the stability will depend on the signs of these three terms. So that's step three. Step four now is to compute algebra. Thank you to Poincaré once again. No idea how you do that. Any more check? All right. But then I also need more paper. I should keep the bunch of there, maybe. So what are my eigenvalues? Well, if you remember, as usual, we saw determinant of lambda or lambda minus k. Just like this. So in this case, there is determinant minus lambda minus beta times s, 0, beta s minus b minus n. And now I must compute the determinant of this. Equal to 0, which implies what? You get minus lambda times beta s minus b minus lambda is equal to 0. So what are my solutions to this equation? Very good. So remember, I want two eigenvalues. So the first one is just going to be 0, and the second one is going to be beta s. And as I said, it's not a problem when you just have one eigen zero eigenvalue. It's a problem when there's two. So in the case when you have one zero eigenvalue, you just look at the sign of the other one. And you can do this. I will not go into the theory of why this is possible. But so. What type of equilibrium point do I have if all the eigenvalues have non-zero real value? What is that called? Hyperbolic value. In the case when you have just one zero eigenvalue, such a point is called normally hyperbolic. And this theory, which was the I believe founded by German mathematician Bolbach, um, allows you to ignore the zero eigenvalues. So you just study the stability of the point by looking at the non point, which is this one. So now you see, is it a sink, is it a source, or is it a cell? It depends now on what the signs of these parameters are going to be. So it's a little bit more complicated, but not really. It's just now some algebra with inequality. In other words, 
So look at sine of lambda two is equal to beta s. Now there's a bunch of cases. If lambda 2 is 0, which is the bad case of the two-dimensional center manifold, this will occur when beta s is equal to b. We can have a sink if my eigenvalue is negative, so when lambda 2 is less than 0. And that is when beta s minus b is less than 0. Okay. And of course, this means that S must be between 0 and B over beta. Because remember, S, I, and R are simply positive points. So let's bound the lower one. Okay. And it can be a, so this is going to be a sink. You can have a source if lambda 2 is positive. And we just reverse the sign. So this means that beta S minus B is greater than 0. And that means that S must be greater than B. OK. So that's how you do this type of analysis. You see, you can have a sink or a source now, depending on what the signs of B and B are. It was not like this before, because we just had fixed numbers. So we always got a distinct answer. Are you going to have a sink or a or source? Now it depends on what parameters you feel in and remember these are parameters, it's your choice. Whatever you want, whatever. But ideally, you pick these from the data. That's a bit of a so you do some type of regression that gives you both these numbers are based on the data of infectious diseases. OK. Any name for number one? Sorry? Any name for number one? Uh, oh, yes. So in this case, you have two zero IP. And you have a, a center number. So you must actually do a bit more analysis for this. It's not complex, so it's not going to be a center or a center. That's the problem. So it is a center map. Sorry? It is a center map. Oh, yes, yes, because you still have two zero arguments. So I will just. Yes, so I wrote that. So in other words, in summary, what we can say about this SIO and you have two minutes left to do these evaluations, which is stupid on my part. So in other words, so the line I equals to zero, which corresponds to zero infected, is a local sink. If 0 is less than s, less than b, b, and it's a source if s is greater than b. So there's something happening between this transition when you have less than b over b and then greater than b over b. The stability of the system changes fundamentally from a singular source. So we have to analyze this a bit more detail, which I will do on Wednesday. And the uh, basic idea is the following, is that when you have three parameters, this leads to the phenomenon of what we call bifurcation, which are the most interesting part of dynamics. And bifurcation really means a change in stability of the system. So I will continue with this on Wednesday, but now you will have to oblige me with these course evaluations. Uh, any questions about this? So that you see now, it's the same thing over and over again. I solve my equilibrium points, I find the eigenvalues, and I just look at the signs of it. And sometimes you'll get center manifolds, and you must do some more analysis, like a numerical solution or a beyond the function or something. But it's the same steps again and again. The remarkable thing that you should take away is that all the theories in math and science boil down to this. So this is a fundamental language of nature, is that. But anyway, okay, so 